All right, and then wrapping up here, and um, with a really dramatic example here, this uh, case seven, the history is, and then I'll come back to the gross. A 60-year-old man with a large destructive lytic pelvic bone mass that extended all the way from the acetabulum all the way back to the sacroiliac joint. And um, uh, this obviously is malignant, right? Because this is a hemipelvectomy specimen. So I don't have the radiograph to show you, but I will show you the gross, which here I think accomplishes really quite the, the same thing. So there's a, a really dramatic gross example, and you can see the acetabulum here, and here's tumor just filling all of the medullary cavities, some little islands breaking away from the main mass, glistening, kind of whitish, translucent, and you can see it going all the way back here. Here's the iliac uh, wing, all the way back to the sacral, uh, sacroiliac joint right there and kind of eroding into the joint space a little bit, but not definitively crossing into the sacrum. And if you've never grossed a hemipelvectomy, let me tell you, um, it, that anatomy is a lot more complex than, than it seems like at first glance, especially if it comes without a leg, it's just got like an internal hemipelvectomy. I usually have to have help from my surgery colleagues to help me orient them. I, I still find it really challenging to figure out all the different areas. Um, so if, if there's ever a time you want your surgeon to come look at a specimen with you, it's when you have a complex ortho case. Uh, like that. Okay, so that is the gross um, image here. And then let's look at the slide. And I did, because this is a really a good example of something pretty uncommon, I put in like five slides um, and I'll show you a few of them here. All right, who would like to describe it? I can do that. Okay. Um, so in this first set of slides that we have here, essentially the entire left side is involved by this uh, kind of chondroid stroma with a bunch of uh, atypical looking cells yeah. uh, filling up the marrow space. I think this is all uh, marrow space that's being infiltrated. It, it looks like trabecular bone and not necessarily like tumor bone. That's Very bone. good. That's a, that's a hugely important thing to figure out. And so how did you make that distinction? I'm curious. Um, well, partly architecturally, it looks like it's forming a trabecular. It, it looks like there's yes. um, you know, normal osteo sites contained within it. Yeah, it's right. It's got, it's lamellar bone, right? It's got, it's got osteocytes and lacunae. It's got nice lamellar bone lines. So when a tumor makes new bone, it usually has like the look of woven bone, just like woven bone can be made by some tumors or as a reactive reparative process. I think when I see woven bone, it's always abnormal. It doesn't mean always tumor, but it always means it's either the body repairing an injury, which is a technically some sort of pathology, even if the body's doing what it's supposed to, or it's tumor making bone or metaplastic bone, both benign and malignant tumors can do that. But once you have nice lamellar bone, yeah, a metaplastic bone can eventually become lamellar over time. But here, like you said, it's got the perfect trabecular architecture and it's lamellar bone. This is pre-existing bone being completely surrounded and infiltrated by tumor, right? So what is this right here? What's the diagnosis? And this would suggest a chondrosarcoma. Absolutely. This is the hallmark of what we want for chondrosarcoma. The, the grade one, low grade chondrosarcomas, which the WHO that just came out this year for bonus soft tissue has some new terminology that I encourage you to go read. It's a little bit complicated, but on the low end of the spectrum is always a challenge of telling is it an enchondroma versus a grade one chondrosarc? And I, I got Andrew Rosenberg, an amazing bone pathologist, to come and sit down with me at the scope and um, a couple years ago and tell me about this. And I made a video of it and I've got that on my, my channel. I'll put a link down below. I highly recommend that he is an absolutely master educator, just incredible. I learned so much um, from him. But the infiltration or what we call permeative growth is the classic feature of chondrosarcomas. And in the grade one chondrosarcomas, the low grade one, to me, that's the, the main and sometimes only feature. The problem is a lot of times all you get is a biopsy or curette fragments, which makes it almost impossible to see if there's any permeative growth. But if you're wondering when people talk about permeative growth in a cartilage lesion, this is what it is. This is classic islands of pre-existing bone completely surrounded by chondroid matrix and tumor cells. But here we don't really even need uh, the entrapment to tell that it's malignant. Well, for one thing, on the imaging and the gross, we know that it's behaving, growing in a malignant way. And here it's way too cellular. It's hyperchromatic, atypical nuclei. Although I think that assessing nuclear atypia in chondroid lesions is actually really challenging because they often have kind of little dark um, cytoplasm that clumps around the nucleus. And it makes it really hard to see, like, is that nucleus? Is it cytoplasm? I can't tell. But the cellularity here, I mean, it does to me look atypical, but I, if you struggle with that, so do I. 
So just, just FYI, anyone watching this, if you find it hard to evaluate chondrocyte atypia, you're not alone. So in any case, a two cellular, it's a lot of myxoidy backgrounds here, which is another worrisome feature. So yeah, I would call this, based on this one area of the slide, I would say this is chondrosarcoma grade two, um, at least. I, I don't see any areas that I would call grade three, but grading chondrosarcomas is, is very subjective and not everyone agrees on it. So uh, there may be a bone pathologist watch this and be like, Jared's crazy and that's fine. I'm cool with that. This is the um, cortex and this is tumor, but this cartilage looks very, very different, doesn't it? Right. And then there's a space and then there's more cartilage that looks like that. Then there's another bone. This is something you probably rarely ever get to see. It's certainly never a specimen like this. This one turned out with just perfect sections. It's like really the best, most demonstrative example I've ever seen. I'll show you the gross again. What you're seeing is this. That's the sacroiliac um, joint right there. It's that that is the cartilage at the joint space. Isn't that amazing to see? And so sometimes it's hard on bone specimens, especially if you have lower grade cartilage thing to tell, is that cartilage part of the tumor or is it part cartilage that lines the joint, particularly like in the ribs, this can be a problem. And um, so when you see cartilage, it looks really different and it's got like some little like little clusters, chondrocyte clones, it's probably got some degenerative uh, joint disease kind of changes here. Yeah, that's actually just his normal um, or not totally normal, it's reactive. But it, that's his background uh, cartilage that lines the joint. He does have some damage to the, the cortex here, but definitive, like this is, I don't know exactly if this is a little bit of a fracture or reactive, but I didn't see definitive tumor going all the way across, I don't think. Like this was the closest area, but I think this is all disruption of the, uh, the joint uh, cartilage here. So you can see where the joint, the bone ends here, and then there's the joint. There's, a, uh, I guess, a ligament. I'm sure an orthopedic surgeon would know the name for that, but I don't. So... As much as I like bone and soft tissue tumors, I was not a huge fan of bone and soft tissue anatomy in med school. It's true, true story, sorry. All right, so sorry, I went on and on, and now uh, let's see the other area. I just, a really, really amazing specimen, a very unfortunate case for the patient. So, okay, so what else? Let me go to the next slide, and then you can tell me about that. Um, which one was the best? Probably this one's good. This one's really kind of washed out. Which I, and I think it was from the scanning, having trouble telling the real pale, sometimes chondroid and mixoid things, um, the light source can have a problem, but it's actually convenient here because look, it gives us a good look at the nuclei. Even though they're washed out, they are really big and ugly. When I start seeing pleomorphic nuclei and real cellular areas, then I would say this is to me grade three chondrosarcoma. Really, I wanna see like big pleomorphism and ideally find some mitoses to say grade three. Okay, but then what's happening over here? Did you see this area? Yeah, so there are some areas here that almost look de-differentiated. Like there's these large atypical pleomorphic spindle cell looking cells that don't really have, you know, any chondroid differentiation left. Very it good. Looks like they're forming osteoid. Yeah. There's like an osteosarcomatous component to this as well. Very good. So what would you what would your line diagnosis be for this lesion? Yeah, so this is kind of what I was struggling with. You know, whether this is a de-differentiated chondrosarcoma versus a chondroblastic osteosarcoma. Well, it's really challenging, right? And especially on a needle biopsy, it could be impossible to, to tell on H&E. So I'll have to tell you that the honest truth, this, this I remember this case because this was the first time I had seen one of these and I was struggling. I thought this is clearly cartilaginous everywhere else in the tumor. It's clearly chondrosarcoma on the gross. You can't really even very much appreciate these areas of osteoid. And on the imaging, it was clearly the on you know on imaging on MRI and some other things the the musculoskeletal radiologist usually can tell apart chondrosarc and osteosarc. So when you're struggling, that's the first place to go. Talk to the radiologist if you don't have a musculoskeletal radiologist. Get the disc sent out to someone who has experience in looking at those because osteosarc has often, you know, periosteal elevation and matrix formation, bone formation in the soft tissue. There's a lot of features that they have. And then on MRI, there's different signal intensities that really show this looks like great for chondrosarc. So the radiologist said, no, this is definitely chondrosarcoma. Like the pelvis is a real good site for chondrosarcoma. Um, older people can get osteosarc, but um, I don't know if I've, I guess I've seen some osteosarcs in the pelvis of older people actually. So, but I, I was like, but how do I explain this osteosarc component? So I must have missed this day in fellowship, but actually when chondrosarcoma de-differentiates, it often produces either pleomorphic spindle cell, like looks like undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, or it produces an osteosarcoma component. So this is actually D-diff chondrosarcoma with 
osteosarcoma is heterologous component, but you perfectly uh, recognize that that's the main differential between those two. And, uh, and I had to actually go back and look into this and realize, oh, this, this actually is a com not common, this is a relatively rare, DDF chondrosarcoma is relatively uncommon, but, um, but actually this is well described that they do produce osteoid. So this is perfect though. If you just had a biopsy of this, I would have called this osteosarcoma. It's pleomorphic, ugly, high-grade cells making little wisps of, of osteoid, which is going on to join up and obviously pick up purpley blue calcium and turning into calcium hydroxyapatite. This is like the classic feature of osteosarcoma. And you are absolutely right too, especially if it's in a young patient. If you think you see a chondrosarcoma in a kid, you better make sure it's not, it's almost much more likely to be chondroblastic osteosarc because kids just don't get chondrosarcomas. I've seen it in people in their 20s, but really rare. And I've never seen one in a child. I think uh, I've never seen one under the age of 20, a chondrosarc. So in young people, that is absolutely the a really, if I see the, this area in a biopsy from a you know 10 year old, I would say that's chondroblastic osteosarc. And I would um, probably, of course, I mean, obviously I would check with the radiologist and make sure it made sense. But um, yes, so this is an area of de-differentiated uh, de -differentiated chondrosarcoma with heterologous um, osteosarcomatous components. And over here, it looks more just like, like kind of UPS, like, you know, you don't really see osteoid formation, just sheets of ugly cells, some giant cells in there. So... If you were really struggling though, the other thing you could do, particularly if you had a small biopsy or the radiology was not certain, do you know any, does anyone know any molecular finding that you can use to help support a diagnosis of chondrosarcoma? Although it's not perfect, but it, it's supportive if it's positive. Yeah, I think our, one of our fellows actually mentioned it in the chat. It would be IDH1 oh. or IDH2. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't even, I don't even have the chat pulled up. I didn't even realize. I'm sorry. Yeah, IDH1 and IDH2 are, are mutated um, one of them is mutated in the majority of cartilaginous tumors. That includes both benign things like enchondroma as well as chondrosarcoma. So it is not useful to tell you if you're dealing with benign versus malignant cartilage. But if you're telling, is it a cartilage tumor versus an osteosarcoma, it can be helpful if it's positive. Positive strongly supports chondrosarcoma. Negative does not disprove it at all because a subset of chondrosarcs are negative. So I, I always start with the radiology and all of those other features, but then in a difficult case, you definitely can send off for mutation analysis for IDH1, IDH2. And in hard cases, that can be helpful because there is actually a, not only a treatment and prog a prognosis difference, but there's also a significant treatment difference. Chondrosarcomas, unfortunately, do not respond very well to chemo or any other thing. They're basically a surgical disease. Um, D-diff chondrosarcoma has a very, very poor prognosis. The vast majority of these patients die within five years. And uh, it's, a, it's a really terrible diagnosis to have to make. Osteosarcoma is obviously very serious, but they have a specialized chemotherapy regimen that's often used, particularly in young people. Um, and they tend to like to pre-treat them with chemo, at least my understanding from the oncologist I've worked with. They often get pre-treatment and then get a resection. So there is a different approach that is taken. But um, so ideally, you like to be able to sort that out on a biopsy before the um, excision happens. I can't remember what the biopsy showed on this one. I think it just showed the chondrosarc without the DDIF component because the DDIF area was actually relatively small um, in this case. And most of the tumor looked like regular grade two to grade three chondrosarcoma. So anyway, I'm sorry I put that one last because I knew I would go on and on because it's really just a very dramatic example. And it's something that, you know, it's, it's really rare to get a chance to see a specimen like this. And I, I really wish uh, it would have been otherwise for the patient's sake. But um, okay, any questions about that or anything else? That's our last uh, case.